what are the Dead Sea Scrolls? Right. So the Dead Sea Scrolls are ancient scrolls that were discovered in caves by the northwest shore of the Dead Sea uh, in the vicinity of an archaeological site called Qumran. And it was apparently members of a Jewish sect who lived at Qumran in the first century BC and first century AD, who used those scrolls and deposited them in the nearby caves. And what we have from uh, the caves are the remains of approximately a thousand different scrolls altogether that were found in 11 different caves. And all of the scrolls represent works of, um, of uh, Jewish religious literature. So there are no um, historical works among the Dead Sea Scrolls. There are no personal documents. Um, it's all Jewish religious works. And about a quarter of the scrolls are copies of books of the Hebrew Bible or what you might call the Old Testament. And then there uh, is a whole series of scrolls that are sort of um, related to biblical literature. So things like interpretations of or commentaries on biblical books or translations of biblical books, um, some works that never made it into the biblical corpus, but were uh, part of uh, the Jewish uh, religious works that circulated at that time. And then there are also works that are sectarian, by which I mean works that were written by members of this sect, not necessarily at Qumran, but members of this sort of sect, um, which describe their distinctive beliefs and practices. So that's basically what the Dead Sea Scrolls are. So if I'm not wrong, I think they were uh, discovered, I think, in 45, 46, if I'm not wrong. 19. Close, close, close. They, the first of the scrolls were discovered in the winter spring of 1946-47. Uh, and it was an accidental discovery. A Bedouin boy, a nomad, wandered into the first of the caves where scrolls were found, what we call Cave 1 and reportedly found a row of tall cylindrical pottery jars covered with lids. Um, and he and other members of his tribe opened up the jars and found that at least a couple of them contained ancient scrolls and eventually removed seven complete or nearly complete scrolls from that cave, Cave 1. Um, do you find it like surprising that it took us so long to discover these, uh, uh, to discover this cave and to discover these, uh, you know, um, these documents or these scrolls per se? Um, well, I, I guess it's it's so, sort of one of those uh, fortunate accidents of history that they had not been discovered and removed previously, but um, it's actually possible that there were scrolls that were found in caves in the area that were removed because we have reports from antiquity uh, on a couple of different occasions where uh, biblical scrolls reportedly were found in caves in the vicinity of Jericho and, and Qumran is not very far from Jericho. Um, and so it's actually, it's possible, and, and we don't, we'll never know for sure, that some scrolls were already found in antiquity and removed from caves in the vicinity. But you're right. I mean, we're lucky that, at least in the case of these 11 caves, these scrolls had not been discovered previously. And that that's due to a series of, you know, accidents of history. Um, the Bedouins in general, before the discovery of the scrolls, at least, generally didn't go into caves. Uh and, you know, there hadn't been a lot of systematic archaeological exploration of this area before that first discovery. So, you know, there were a series of factors that contributed to this. Uh, do you think uh, we will have another discovery on the scale or on the um, uh, on the success of maybe uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, like on that level? Or, or do you think the exploration is maybe... Well, I so I'm an archaeologist. I look backwards, not forwards. <laughs> So I can tell you what happened in the past. I can't tell you what will happen in the future. But, um, but yeah, but no, I, I mean, um, I, I just, I, I would say that I can't, you know, you can't rule out the possibility. So the area has been pretty well explored at this point uh, because, of course, everybody's wanted to discover more scrolls. So there have been, you know, a number of different expeditions right up to really just almost completely the present. Uh, and 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 in these expeditions, they have found uh, ancient remains and sometimes even scrolls, but not scrolls that are associated with the site of Qumran, not, not sectarian scrolls. But there have been some scroll finds in the area of the Dead Sea in recent years. 
Um, it's possible, um, despite the fact that the area has been very thoroughly explored archaeologically, you know, it's possible that there are caves that have not been identified where, let's say, maybe they're not visible, the opening to the cave maybe is sealed and, and it's not really visible, um, or where um, the roof of the cave collapsed and buried stuff under it and there's stuff there that hasn't been found. So, you know, that's one of the great things about archaeology. You know, we, we never know exactly what we're going to find, and um, it's possible that there will be additional discoveries. So, um, like, what is the importance of these discoveries, uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, right? Like, um, like why is it important? And uh, maybe you can put that yeah. in context, maybe, yeah. Right. So, you know, one of the things that I like to say about the Dead Sea Scrolls is that almost everybody has heard of them, but most people have no idea what they are. <laughs> And I think that uh, I think that the reason why people have heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls and why they've kind of gotten so much publicity is because there's this kind of general perception that they have something to do with Jesus and early Christianity. And that's not really true. I mean, they do date to the time of Jesus uh, and the community that lived at Qumran was there in the time of Jesus, but they don't have anything to do directly with Jesus or the New Testament. So first of all, rule that out as, you know, what the... But, but there are other things that are significant about the Dead Sea Scrolls. So one is that we have among the Dead Sea Scrolls the earliest copies of the Hebrew Bible that have ever been found. So the earliest copies of the books of the New Test of the Old Testament. Um, and this is important because until the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, the earliest copies of the Hebrew Bible that we had dated to the 9th and 10th centuries AD, which basically means like the Middle Ages. The scrolls date to mostly the 2nd and 1st centuries BC some of them a little earlier, some of them a little later. And that means that they take us back much closer to the time when the Hebrew Bible was first edited and written down. And we can then see what changes, if any, have been made in the text of the Hebrew Bible over the course of centuries, right? So they're, they're very important for understanding the sort of history and text of the Hebrew Bible. But aside from that, they also shed light on Judaism in the time of Jesus. So anybody who's interested in Jesus and the Dead Sea Scrolls, what's really important about them is that they help flesh out our understanding of Jews and Judaism in the time of Jesus so that you can sort of situate Jesus better within that Jewish context. Because basically what you have in this period, so again, we're, we're talking now, let's say first century BC, first century AD, what call, what's called in Jewish history, the late second temple period, what you have is Jewish society divided into a lot of different groups, and they're all Jewish. They all believe that as a Jew, you should observe biblical Jewish law, but they disagree on the interpretation and practice of specific points of law. And that's where Jesus comes in. So Jesus, like everybody else, right? He, he's a Jew. He observes biblical Jewish law, but he has some of his own interpretations of specific points, and that's what you see him presented as debating on with his opponents, mostly the Pharisees and the gospel accounts. And so, so what, when we look at the scrolls, what we get an understanding of is sort of this broader context of Jesus and where he has specific points of similarity and difference with some of these other groups, and especially with the group that lived at Qumran, which had its own specific outlook. So if you compare what we have at Qumran, that group who are I think are the Essenes, and many scholars think they're Essenes. If you compare their beliefs and practices with what we read about in the gospel accounts, there are some striking similarities with what you hear about in the gospels, with, with you know, what Jesus is preaching, but there are also some very important differences. So that's sort of, you know, for a lot of people, that would be uh, really what an important aspect of the Dead Sea Scrolls would be. Um, what effect did uh, the discovery of, uh, I mean, did, um... Um, so up until uh, up until the discovery of uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls, uh, I mean, Judeo Judaism would have its own um, like Judaism would have its own path. Did did, did anything change after uh, the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls? Like, was there some reinterpretation of certain things, or uh, did were there certain beliefs that had to be kind of rethought? Were there things like that? Uh, was there like a reexamination of uh, Judaism that had to go through because of the discovery? You know, that's a really interesting question, and the short answer is no. Uh, it did not. And and no, but it's a really interesting question. And, and the reason is that the Judaism that we have today, the Judaism that's observed today, is rabbinic Judaism, which is uh, the Judaism that reflects the, um, the interpretation and rulings of sages called rabbis 
who lived in the centuries after the time of Jesus. And it was their views and their interpretation of biblical law that eventually became normative in Judaism. And so the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls actually did not impact the current practice of Judaism, at least you know mainstream normative Judaism in any way. It's more rather a case of it being um, you know, academic study of the text of the Hebrew Bible, the academic study of early Judaism, which again is pre-rabbinic, right? Understood. Um, going back to the site, maybe, uh, in the sense, um, are there any challenges or like unique difficulties maybe while interpreting uh, like sites like Qumran uh, and also maybe um, once you discover these uh, scrolls or what, once you discover certain things um, in, the, in the site, in the archaeological site per se, um, maybe the challenges to presenting that knowledge to the public or to people who may be, um, uh, you oh, know, yeah. uh, to convince people that, you know, this is something. Uh, uh, so can you maybe speak to that maybe? Yeah. Um, you know, so, so uh, I, you know, personally, I believe that as scholars, we have a, um, an obligation to share our research with the general public. And I, you know, I publish a lot and, and do a lot um, in terms of communicating with the broader public. Uh, with Qumran in particular, it's interesting because the Dead Sea Scrolls are, you know, so well known. Again, not everybody necessarily understands exactly what they are, but pretty much everybody's heard of them and it kind of has this like interest in, ooh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And therefore, um, any claim, any sensational claim about the Dead Sea Scrolls or about the group that lived at Qumran, the Essenes, gets automatically gets huge amounts of publicity, right? Uh, and so I think that one of the great challenges is, and this is not just true of, of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is true of lots of other aspects of the study um, of the past, uh, but, it, but it really is true of the scrolls because, of the, because they're so well known in, in the public mind. Um, one of the great challenges is kind of as an academic, as a scholar, um, presenting, you know, what is mainstream scholarship on the scrolls and what are reasonable interpretations and understandings to the general public in contrast to some of the sensational claims that are made. So, you know, every time somebody comes out with some new interpretation that, you know, flies in the face of the evidence, but, you know, it gets a lot of publicity, um, I'm off, you know, I'm called on, you know, I'm contacted by the media or whatever to sort of respond, right? Uh, and so one of the things that I've tried to do is, for example, publish, you know, publish books or whatever um, that kind of present, okay, so what, what do we know? How do we know it? Um, what are these other, you know, interpretations saying and why, you know, do they not really make sense? Uh, and, and so that kind of thing. So I, I do think that's an ongoing uh, issue with, with the Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually, yeah, I actually, by the way, I'll, I'll just say parenthetically, I think that's true of, of anything relating to Jesus, uh, it, you know, archaeology and Jesus, right? So, I mean, if you look at, at programs on TV, uh, the Holy Grail or the Shroud of Turin or, you know, the 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 the, the tomb of Jesus or whatever, right? So you, you come across this. So, and I think that, that because of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the perception that they have something to do with Jesus, they kind of get, you know, a lot of publicity also for that reason. Um, but is when you're doing this public outreach, uh, public outreach, is, is it like very hard? I mean, in, in, by very hard, I mean what I'm trying to get at is, um, are people receptive to the arguments that you make, or uh, is there, um, uh, you know, is there a lot of dogmatism that maybe they carry, and it's difficult to get through that? Uh, um, what is your sense in um, the work that you've done, maybe in, on the outreach? Uh, has it mostly right. been positive, or um... I, you know, I mean. Um, I'm sure it's hard for me to say what, how people, you know, individually react to, to, you know, unless they contact me and they say so. And I do get, I do get mail, I get fan mail, I get non-fan mail, right? Um, and, and, but, but I, I, and that's fine. I mean, everybody, my, my, the way that I look at things and it's like what the way I teach students, my job is to inform and educate, right? To present the evidence um, and then, you know, people can look at it and they can decide for themselves if they find this convincing or they disagree or whatever. I will say that I never try deliberately to undermine 
anybody's personal faith or beliefs. That's not my goal. Um, my, I feel that people are welcome to believe, you know, whatever their, their personal beliefs are, whatever their personal faith is, you know, that that's fine. And, and they're entitled to that. But I, I do try to present the, you know, the information, um, in, as sort of a, um, a clear and respectful way as possible. So, um, I'm always trying to be, when I, when I present, I try to present things in a way that people will understand, but without being patronizing or, or condescending, just trying to be clear and to lay out the evidence. And then, you know, once it's out there, as I say, people can, can either read or look at a video or whatever, and then decide for themselves. Right. Um, so, <clears throat> So I think you touched on this uh, in the sense that uh, so uh, you, you you mentioned multiple times that you know everybody's heard of these dead scrolls and you know uh, people have their own assumptions of these uh, scrolls. Uh, so why do you think uh, you know these scrolls have captured like the public's imagination per se? Like, do you have any yeah. uh, theories on that? No, I, yeah, I do. I think it's because I think it's because people think they have something to do with Jesus, and that that goes back to the initial discovery of the scrolls, because the 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 site of Qumran was uh, excavated by a French, a Dominican, French biblical scholar and archaeologist named Roland Deveau, who was associated with the French School of Biblical Studies and Archaeology in Jerusalem. And Deveau and his team, uh, the team of scholars that, that, then, um, that were assembled to publish the scrolls when they were first found, they were all male white men uh, from Western Europe and the United States, and most of them were Catholics, and they were all Christians. There were no Jews, there were no women, whatever. And their their particular viewpoint and their interest was, in fact, well, what does this tell us about Jesus and the time of Jesus, right? I mean, that's their own. And so very early on, the scrolls became associated with Jesus, people thought, well, they, ooh, what are they going to tell, you know, what are the Dead Sea Scrolls going, what light are they going to shed on, you know, Jesus and the New Testament? Um, and that perspective has changed over time um, as we've come to understand, you know, what what the scrolls actually are. And as uh, the team of scholars who worked on the scrolls has broadened to include women and Jews and people with all sorts of different perspectives. Right. So um, but that I think that that this idea that they're somehow connected with Jesus goes back to the period of the initial discovery. Um, so just to follow, uh, so just to maybe extend that, um, uh, in the in, in the beginning you did mention that it's it's it doesn't the scrolls don't have a lot to do with Jesus, but uh, have the scrolls uh, have they impacted Christianity in any way? Uh, have the scrolls impacted Christianity in terms of the act? So my my answer to that would be like Judaism. I think no is the answer. Uh, originally and. Some of your listeners may, if they're old enough, will remember this. Back in the 1980s, there were a lot of scandals about uh, um, about the slow rate of publication of the Dead Sea Scrolls, that a lot of scrolls had not yet been published at that point. Most of the scrolls were discovered um, during the course of the, uh, especially the earlier part of the 1950s. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm really sorry. Uh, I'm, so, uh, but can you just clarify what do you mean uh, when you say they have not been published? I mean, so right. they, so they had not been published. In other words, so it's not, you know, it's the scrolls. It's not like you got you got a newspaper and you open it up and you read it. Right. When we talk about these scrolls, what we're talking about overwhelmingly are small fragments surviving from what originally were complete scrolls. And um, a lot of times it's very hard to see what letters are written on those little fragments. Um, and what scholars originally were trying to do, this is the team that Devo assembled, right, was to take this mass of scroll material that originally consisted of almost a thousand different scrolls, but it disintegrated into thousands and thousands and thousands of little fragments, to take them and try and figure out what pieces went with the same scrolls and what kind of literature this represented. And all of this was being done um, before the advent of, of the computer, right? That was being done by hand, right? They're taking these little fragments by hand and trying to, um, and so, so there was, so the rate of publication, because then you can't, I mean, if you, the, the scrolls weren't accessible un, it, until they were published, until the scholars actually took them and said, okay, hmm, this fragment, we can see this letter and this letter on it, and we're going to make a, you know, a big book, and we're going to put all the fragments that we can read, and we're going to publish it, right? Well, that took, you know, that took a lot of time. Again, there weren't computers back then. Uh, and so, so 
for a very long time after the discovery, you know, uh, years after the discovery of decades, after the discovery of the scrolls, initially, the publication rate was very slow. And uh, by the time you get to the 1980s, scholars who were not part of the publication team and didn't have access to the scrolls were starting to make a lot of noise, right? Rightfully so, right? So what we want to know what's there. We can't, we don't have access. Guys, publish this already, right? There were some reasons for the delays, but what happened is, is that a series of conspiracy theories started to develop by the 1980s about the slow rate of publication. And among those conspiracy theories was a conspiracy theory that alleged that um, scholars were trying to hide information in the scrolls because the information would overturn the teachings of the Catholic Church. And the reason for that was because DeVoe, of course, was a Dominican priest. So the idea was, well, DeVoe and his team are conspiring because there's stuff in here that's going to, you know, overturn, you know, the teachings of the, right? Well, now all the Dead Sea Scrolls are fully published and all of them are accessible even online. They're on Google. You can go and check it out. So, you know, we know that there's nothing in there that that is going to, that overturns the teachings of the of the church in any way. But that was, you know, originally a big, conspiracy theory. Um, and so the short answer to your question is, as far as I know, no. I mean, there's nothing in there that that has caused any, you know, overturning of dogma or whatever in, in the Catholic Church um, or any other, you know, church for that matter, um, or caused, you know, any significant changes in any way, right? Um, I, yeah. Yeah, I, I wanted to ask you while you were, while you were, giving, uh, yeah, I wanted to ask you like, you know, uh, d d uh, before you, like while you were answering that, uh, a thought came to my mind in the sense of, d did you suspect any manipulation on the part while, uh, you know, while, while before it was being published, but uh, I think you, you fairly said, you know, it was yeah. all a conspiracy, so you don't believe, okay, sure. Um, well, we, well, we know because again, the scrolls are all accessible. So, uh, you know, people can go in and check them out for themselves, right? There, there were actually similar allegations about DeVoe. DeVoe not only um, led the team that discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls and published the Dead Sea Scrolls, but also excavated the archaeological site at Qumran, which again was apparently inhabited by members of a Jewish sect who me and a lot of other people we think are Essenes, um, who deposited the scrolls in the caves. And, um, you know, there's been some controversy about DeVoe's understanding of the site of Qumran uh, because in some cases he used kind of monastic terminology when he described some of the rooms, like he described uh, the dining room as a refectory uh, and a room where apparently scrolls were being written, he described it as a scriptorium, right? And so there were allegations that DeVoe's interpretation of the archaeology of the site, uh, that his interpretations were influenced by his, you know, Catholic background, right? His Dominican background. Um it's true that that DeVoe sometimes did use that kind of terminology, but it doesn't mean that it was incorrect. I mean, the refectory actually is a dining room and the so-called scriptorium apparently actually was used for writing scrolls and DeVoe himself never interpreted Qumran as a monastery. Uh, so, um, so, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I don't think that, that the inter De DeVoe's interpretations were super influenced in a bad way, let's say by, you know, his, his Catholic uh, background. I mean, so, um, so I'm going to be asking a lot of stupid questions along the way. So please uh, no, forgive good. me. Uh, so uh, I'm guessing he got access to, I mean, I'm guessing he got access to all this because it was mostly first come first serve basis. Like when he was involved in the excavation or maybe, you know, he was, uh, I'm guessing that's yeah, yeah, so there's actually a whole kind of a backstory to this, right? Um, which is that, you know, again, the first of the scrolls were discovered by accident in Cave One in the winter spring of 1946-47 by Bedouins. The Bedouins removed these seven scrolls from Cave One. Uh, they didn't know that they were ancient scrolls. The scrolls are written on parchment, which is processed animal hide. And so to the Bedouins, the scrolls look like pieces of old leather. And they did the logical thing. They sold them to a shoemaker, a cobbler, in the area of Bethlehem, whose name was Kando. And Kando then divided those seven scrolls into two lots. He sold four of the scrolls to the patriarch of his church in Jerusalem, a man named Mar Athanasius Samuel, or Athanasius Yeshua Samuel, who was the metropolitan of the church. Uh, the other three scrolls he sold to um, Elazar Lipasukenik, an Israeli uh, biblical uh, archaeologist in Jerusalem. 
And then eventually the four scrolls that Athanasius Yeshua Samuel had purchased were, were uh, acquired by Sukenik's son, Yuga el Yadin. So long story short, those seven scrolls eventually ended up legally, legally, in the hands of the state of Israel. And the state of Israel then built a special building called the Shrine of the Book uh, on the grounds of the Israel Museum in Jerusalem to house and display those seven scrolls. Now, what happens then is when those first seven scrolls surfaced on the antiquities market, which is basically what happened, they had no provenience. We, nobody knew where they had come from. And it took a little while for scholars to realize that they had come from the area of Qumran, from caves in the area of Qumran. And so what happens is, is that in the early 1950s, uh, an archaeological expedition was organized to Qumran to see if there were any more scrolls to be found. And that expedition was organized and led by DeVoe. And so what happens is, is that DeVoe's expedition subsequently then, this from 1951 to 56, explored the caves in the area of Qumran and excavated the site of Qumran. At the same time, the Bedouins were still searching the area for scrolls, and they also found some of the scrolls even then, um, which they then sold to DeVoe, right? DeVoe purchased from them. There's a whole long story there because it was through the Jordanian government, because at the time the area was under the rule of the government of Jordan. But anyway, that's how it comes to be that DeVoe comes to be in sort of control of this material, so to speak, right? I think... Uh... I think it's a nice way to be in history just by discovering things and you know uh i mean we get it i mean you get a place in history because uh you were there at the place while something was being excavated yeah. or something was being that's a uh, i wouldn't say easy but uh it seems like not a bad way to go around history uh, yeah. oh yeah um could you maybe talk about uh, some of the methods that were used to uh date the deaths uh the scrolls and uh maybe also uh like reason why um why is it no why is it important to know their age as well like uh like how does that right well i mean the the ages are important because first of all if if we have early copies of of the books of the hebrew bible right the date is going to make a big difference but also um in terms of the other scrolls how do they relate to the archaeological site of qumran because through the archaeology we can date the site of qumran we have pottery we have coins at the site we know the site dates to the 1st century bc 1st century ad so do the scrolls date to the same period as the site or not, right? So that's that's an important thing. Um, and there are different methods for dating the scrolls. Um, one is a very uh, old method, uh, so to speak, has been around for a long time, which is paleography, which means uh, looking at the handwriting. Because, uh, you know, handwriting changes over time. And I always tell my students, when you were in school, did you have to read like the Declaration of Independence or something like that? And if you did, you can see that it's very hard to read because the handwriting, the letters, right, have changed over time. And so it was also in antiquity, letter forms, the, the actual handwriting changed over time. Um, and there are experts who can look at the style of the letters, the style of the handwriting can give you rough dates. So first of all, we had that all along. But the Dead Sea Scrolls have also been dated using radiocarbon dating which very interestingly was invented right around the time the Dead Sea Scrolls were first found, right at the end of World War II, 1950. Uh, and in fact, radiocarbon dating, carbon-14, was, was used very early on after the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, not in order to date the scrolls, but to test the reliability of radiocarbon dating. In other words, they said, oh, we, these scrolls date to this period. Let's see if the radiocarbon dates confirm that, because they didn't know how reliable radiocarbon dating was at that point. Now, since then, of course, you know, radiocarbon dating has become a lot more refined and a lot more accurate. And uh, different scrolls have been, you know, dated more recently using, you know, these more refined methods. So those are the two main ways that the scrolls are dated. Um, what can, um, like, what light have they shed on uh, of the people uh, during that time? Like, I mean, uh, is there any, uh, maybe uh, not only the people, but also uh, what kind of life did they lead and uh, maybe their practices, um, any any unique practices or uh, something that we might find relevant or, um, um, yeah, a any thoughts on that? Well, you, do you mean the people who lived at Qumran? Huh. So, uh, or, uh, yeah. yeah, Qumran around right. that time, yeah. Well, I mean, that time we're talking about, you know, Jews living in the country uh, and there you have a huge diversity, right, of, of, of Jews and Judaism. Uh, but at the site of Qumran itself, what we have are members of a Jewish sect, again, 
identified by many scholars, including myself as Essenes, who are distinctive because um, they believed that the Jerusalem temple was polluted, that the priests serving in the temple were impure and unfit to serve, and uh, they therefore refused to participate in the sacrifices offered in the temple in Jerusalem and withdrew and constituted themselves conceptually as a sort of substitute temple or substitute desert tabernacle. Uh, and every full member of this sect adopted a priestly lifestyle. They lived as if they were living a temple lifestyle, like they're in a temple or a tabernacle, and every full member is like a priest serving in the presence of God. And this is a remarkable lifestyle. There's a lot of corollaries to it, which would take us a very long time to go over, but it, it, it's a lifestyle which would have impacted every single aspect of their daily life, from what they ate to the way that they dressed, to their toilet habits, um, everything would have been impacted by uh, the consequence of, of adopting, you know, this kind of a lifestyle. Understood. Uh, you touched upon this earlier as well, but uh, uh, how, how did different Jewish groups, uh, the Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, get along with each other during the Second Temple period? And um, uh, what can the Dead Sea Scrolls maybe tell tell us about their relationship? Right. So um, the Dead Sea Scroll. well, you know, our... Our main source on the Jewish groups of the, our main source actually, yeah, uh, on these different Jewish groups of the late Second Temple period is the ancient Jewish historian Josephus, Flavius Josephus, who lived in the first century AD. Now we also have references to these groups in other sources, for example, uh, slightly later rabbinic literature, so like the Mishnah and the Talmud. Um, the New Testament, of course, also refers to some of these groups. Um, and so one of the things that you have to understand is that our, that, you know, what we know about their relationship is based on these sources, the way that they present it. So just because they present things in a certain way doesn't mean that they actually were that way exactly. And it doesn't mean even if they were that that's complete information, right? So if you ask how they got along with each other, okay, so that's based on the sources and the sources have a perspective, right? Josephus, I identifies himself as a Pharisee, for example, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, the the authors of the gospel accounts, for example, right? They're, they're certainly neither Pharisees nor Sadducees. So they're presenting, right? So that doesn't... Okay, so all of that qualified. So one of the things to understand is that that when we talk about these various groups, a lot of the Jewish population apparently didn't belong to any of these groups. A lot of the Jewish population was simply just getting by and trying to survive right? They're just living their everyday lives. So we're not talking about, you know, the entire Jewish population being divided into these sort of factions, right? Um, now, of the factions, uh, the Sadducees were basically the Jerusalem elite, right? They're the they're the 1% living in Jerusalem. They include the high priests and some of the other priestly families. Um, they include royalty and, you know, the super rich, right? Uh, and they are religious and political conservatives. Um, and the reason is because if you have it good, and they had it good, you want to maintain the status quo, meaning you're going to be conservative. So they didn't like innovations. They didn't like innovations in politics. They accommodated with the Roman rulers, for example. Uh, and they didn't like innovations in the interpretation of biblical law. They were literalists, right? If, if it's written in the, in the letter of the law, it exists. If it's not, you don't fool with it, right? That's their approach. The Pharisees, who apparently had so, had some influence in the broader Jewish population, and apparently were also active in Galilee, if we take the gospel account seriously, uh, particularly, right, um, were sort of a, they've been described as kind of a retainer class. I, I don't like to use this word, but they're kind of like what we might think of as an upper middle class. It's anachronistic to say that, but they're basically, they're not the elite, they're not the super wealthy, the 1%, but they're also not like the poor people. They're a little more prosperous. They have, you know, prosperous merchants or farmers or whatever. And they are more liberal uh, in their politics and their interpretation of the law, right? So they think that you can take the law and you can interpret it more flexibly than just looking at the letter of the law. Um, and then we have the Essenes, right, who apparently some of their members apparently were at Qumran, and they have a whole different approach, right, which is this approach that the Jerusalem temple is polluted and 
we don't uh, we we won't participate in the sacrifices there. We're going to withdraw. We're going to live a priestly lifestyle until we can take control of the temple and do things the way we think they should be done. And then you have Jesus's movement, right? Uh, and Jesus has his own particular perspective. And on some points of interpretation, he might agree with any one of the other groups. And then on other points, he might disagree with them, right? Uh, and so that's one of the things that we see particularly highlighted in the gospel accounts, if we take them you know, seriously. Uh, what you see are Pharisees, the Pharisees particularly, criticizing Jesus uh, for um, his the way that he interprets and practices, or he or his disciples, interpret or practice specific points of Jewish law. But that doesn't mean that they all were fighting all the time or they didn't get along, right? They're all Jews. They're all like, it's important to, to observe biblical law, but disagreeing on specific points of, of interpretation and practice. Uh, so uh, one thing I noticed was, uh, so you mentioned two, three times that uh, if we take the gospel account seriously, could you yes. elaborate on that a little bit? I didn't. Yeah, well, yeah, because I mean, I so I just want to highlight that I'm not, I'm not saying that the gospel accounts are necessarily unreliable, but also it's not like the gospel accounts are an historical document per se, right? So I do think that there's a, a lot of valuable um, information about Jesus and his movement in the gospel accounts. I do think so. But, that, but I also don't think that you can just take the gospels at face value and say, this is exactly how it happened, right? And that's true for any ancient source. Um, say the same thing for Josephus, for that matter, who actually did intend to write a history. Uh, and, and the you know, the thing about the Gospels is that um, the earliest of the Gospels, which is thought to be Mark, right, is believed to have been written somewhere around the year 70 AD, either a little before, or a little after, depending on who you follow. And then the other Gospels are later than that. And Jesus, of course, uh, would have been crucified, let's say, somewhere around 33. So I mean, the Gospels aren't actually written down until something like 40 years or more after Jesus's death. And so you also have that time lag. They're not necessary, even though some of the information may go back to the time of Jesus, they're not written down, apparently. They're not composed, right? Until, you know, four decades after the death of Jesus. And so then you have that question again of, well, how accurate, you know, is the information, is, is it all accurate? some of it accurate, what part of it is accurate, right? So I, I actually do think there's a lot of valuable information um, in the Gospels, but uh, but uh, what I, when I say if we take that seriously, then, you know, certain certain information I think can be taken seriously and is reliable, but not necessarily all of it, right? And it depends on what particular points. And again, it's just like evaluating any ancient source. By the way, same thing today, if we're depending on where you get your news from, uh, right. So how much of the news is is reliable or not or how much of it is being presented in a certain way. Right. So you can have news that's reliable. You can have information that's reliable, but it can be presented with a spin. So it's the same thing with ancient sources. Understood. Um, how do the Dead Sea Scrolls provide insights into the evolution of Jewish community over time? How did the Dead Sea Scrolls provide insight into into what sorry jewish community over time are there any insights over um uh, with the way maybe the jewish community has uh um um progressed maybe you mean since then or i mean what sort of going back to one of the points we've we've raised is um what the what the dead sea scrolls do is they help give us a fuller picture of, of Jews and Judaism in the late Second Temple period, so basically in the time of Jesus, right? They, 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 they give us information that we didn't have previously, um, especially about this particular group, right, the Essenes. I'm not sure what how else what else I can say to answer your question. To no, no sure, sure, no. I think I, you did touch upon this. Uh, yeah. Sure, sure. No, fair enough. Uh, what do we know about the role of women in the Essene community, if I'm pronouncing that right? Uh, right. Essene community and the yeah. broader society during that period, if there are right. It's there. very funny, you know, that you say that because uh, I just I teach uh, this semester. I was teaching a seminar, uh, an undergraduate seminar on Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls, and we just did that topic yesterday in class. Uh, and so, so here you actually have to distinguish a couple of things. So you have to distinguish. See, I think again with a majority. I think a majority with a lot of other scholars. 
that the people who lived at Qumran were members of the Essene sect. But it's important to understand that Qumran was not the only place where Essenes lived, that they lived all over the country. Um, it's just that Qumran is the only place where we can identify them, their presence in the archaeological record, and that's because of the scrolls that were found in the caves nearby. Um, so it's important to understand that when we talk about the Essenes, they're, they're all over the place. There was apparently a community that lived in Jerusalem, for example, and not only at Qumran. And so when we talk about women, uh, we need to, to distinguish between women in the broader Essene movement versus what evidence do we have for the presence of women at Qumran. The evidence for women in the Essene movement would be based on um, primarily literary sources, right? So Josephus, for example, who has a very long description of the Essenes, uh, the sectarian scrolls from Qumran, right? That, that kind of information. Whereas at Qumran itself, uh, our, our main source of information would be the archaeology, the archaeological remains. So do we have uh, evidence of women present at Qumran in the actual physical remains at Qumran, right? And so all of that has to be distinguished. And so without going into all of the, this is a very kind of long, this, uh, without going into all of it, I'll, I'll say that um, I think, I, I don't think anybody now, any serious scholars now would, would dispute that there were women in the Essene movement, that, that uh, most of the members, if not all of the members were married and had families. So that was, you know, a, a normal thing that there were women um, in the movement. I, I personally don't think that women could, for various reasons, I don't think they could become full members, but I do, you know, I have no doubt there were women in the Essene movement. Um, probably women became members, uh, became part of the movement either because they were born into it or married into it. Um, so, and, and, you know, the sectarian literature, I think pretty clearly indicates that. Um, at Qumran, on the other hand, there seems, in my opinion, there is very limited evidence for the presence of women. There is evidence, but it's very, very limited. And so uh, I think that that um, there, the community at Qumran consisted overwhelmingly of adult men. This again is based on the archeology. span um, And that, uh, that if women were present there, and apparently there, a small number based on the archeology span were, that they were not, uh, they, they may not have even been in the main part of the settlement. There are various reasons why I say this, which I won't go into. So, so that's kind of the, the short, sort of short answer to that. Understood. Uh, I think uh, uh, I came across two figures. I think uh, you're able to hear me, okay? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so I think one was Teacher of Righteousness, uh, who was mentioned. Right. And I think another one, if I'm pronouncing this right, is Enoch. Am I, am oh, I doing that? well, yeah, right. Huh. Right. Uh, right. So why are these uh, figures um, popular? Like, like... Uh-huh. Right. Okay. So, so first let's get the Enoch out of the way. So Enoch is not a figure in the Qumran sector, the Essene sector, anything like that. Enoch is, uh, is actually a biblical figure. He's mentioned in the, uh, in the book of Genesis um, as one of the uh, forefathers before Noah, before the flood. He's actually the father of Methuselah. Uh, the guy who lived the longest, right? And according to the according to Genesis, Enoch lived for 365 years, and then one day he disappears, literally. Uh, and so what happens is is that in the Second Temple period, Jews started to speculate about what had happened to Enoch, and the speculation developed that God had taken him up to heaven, and he became some kind of a big, powerful angel up there, a divine super angel who's transformed eventually, there's a whole, a whole bunch of literature that's written about what happens to Enoch. And it's called Enochic literature. So you have books, first Enoch, second Enoch, third Enoch, they're written over the course of centuries. And uh, according to this, this literature, Enoch is transformed into this divine super angel called Metatron, who is kind of given uh, a lot of divine secrets that he can share with humankind. And uh, so, so what's interesting is that, you know, Enoch is, is kind of, the books of Enoch are really interesting. They're strange, these kind of strange stories. They're definitely Jewish works, uh, but um, they never made it into the, um, 
canon, the canons of sacred scripture of the Jews or the Catholics or the Protestants for that matter. So you won't find the books of Enoch in, in any Bible that you probably would pull off a shelf. Uh, some of them were preserved in the canons of other churches, like, for example, the Ethiopian church. Um, but what's interesting is that we have copies of uh, First Enoch. There, you know, there are examples at Qumran. Um, and so this was simply part of this broader corpus of literature related to biblical literature that's found among the Dead Sea Scrolls. And it, it, the group at Qumran, the, these Essenes probably liked Enoch for a number of different reasons, but one is that um, there's a big emphasis in Enoch on a solar calendar and it appears that this group preferred a solar calendar, which, by the way, was not apparently widely used among most of the rest of the Jewish population at that time. So that's Enoch. Now, the teacher of righteousness is a whole different thing because the teacher of righteousness is a figure who's mentioned in sectarian scrolls, meaning works that were written by members of this sect. Right? The biblical books were not written by members of this sect or composed by them, but, but the sectarian scrolls were. And so the sectarian scrolls, usually when they refer to real people, people who actually lived, uh, they refer to them not usually, not by their real names, but by nicknames. And one of the nickname figures who appears in some of the sectarian scrolls is a guy who they call the teacher of righteousness. And it's clear from the scrolls that this teacher was uh, a leader of the sect. He either was uh, the founder of the sect or maybe the re-founder of the sect, um, but he's a very important figure. And one of the games that scholars play is trying to identify who he was. I mean, who, who is this guy who the scrolls call the teacher of righteousness? Do we know of somebody who lived at that time? So you may come across theories that the teacher was uh, Jesus or John the Baptist or James the B Just. Uh, those theories uh, really um, have been rejected by pretty much most scholars um, because the scrolls that refer to the teacher of righteousness were originally composed well before the time of Jesus. So that leaves open the question of, well, who was the teacher of righteousness? And one of the things about the nicknames, like teacher of righteousness, there are other nicknames. His opponent is the wicked priest. And you get a guy called the man of lies. And then there's uh, the lion of wrath. You get all these nickname figures. But one of the things is, is that the nicknames are not just nicknames, they're puns. And so the teacher of righteousness is, is a pun a uh, teacher of righteousness. Righteousness in Hebrew tzedek is a pun on Zadok, Z-A-D-O-K, which is very interesting because Zadok was uh, the very first high priest appointed by Solomon, this long before the time of Qumran, appointed by Solomon to officiate in the first temple when Solomon built the first temple. And the high priests who served in the Jerusalem temple after that traced their ancestry back to Zadok. And they became known as Zadokite priests. And the Qumran sect often refers to themselves as the sons of Zadok. They connect themselves to the Zadokites. Uh, and there's a whole long story actually behind this as well. But basically, it, you know, it appears that the teacher of righteousness was, in fact, uh, related to the Zadokite priests. Right. And so hence the nickname, the teacher do, of righteousness. Do you think, uh, do you think we'll... Um... Do you think there's enough evidence for us to ever figure out like who, who that figure was? Or do you think that it'll be a mystery forever? Well, scholars have speculated. So, you know, scholars have, I, have made suggestions about specific historical figures. But barring the discovery of an authentic, you know, a, an un previously unknown authentic ancient Dead Sea Scroll that actually tells us, right, who the teacher of righteousness is, I don't think uh, we can know that for sure. Um, maybe Chad GBT5 will be able to tell us. That is yeah. Yeah. That's a, that's a tech, that's a, I wanted to bring a chat GPT joke. Anyways, uh, <laughs> you touched upon this earlier on the uh, on the possession of the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, but is there any uh, debate on like um, are there people fighting uh, for you know we should have them or uh, maybe, oh maybe yeah shed, shed some light big on that time thing? big 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 time yeah yeah sure yeah that's that's something I think a lot of people don't realize so you know the scrolls the very first scrolls right from Cave One which were found in, for, in the winter spring of 1946-47, were found uh, at the very end of the British Mandate of Palestine. And then, uh, you know, DeVoe's expedition was conducted after the, the British Mandate had ended and Palestine was partitioned. And Qumran at that point lay in what today many people call the West Bank, um, which was under the rule of the government of Jordan 
until Israel took the territory in the Six Day War in 1967. And so uh, today, the majority of the scrolls are in Israel's possession because Israel came into possession both of Qumran and the scrolls that were housed in the Rockefeller Museum in East Jerusalem in 1967. So a majority of the scrolls are, are in you know, Israeli hands today, Israeli control. Um, we're not we're excluding here the seven scrolls from Cave One, which are in the Israel Museum. Those were acquired legally. No, no problem about those. But all the others, right? The majority of the material. Um, and so, you know, the, there's a, a huge debate who who should have the who, you know, who has the legal rights to these scrolls? Is it um the Israelis who actually are in possession of them, but came into possession through uh, you know, through conflict uh and and um you know, many people don't acknowledge Israel's legitimacy of control of that of that territory, um, and therefore with it the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, should the scrolls belong to the Palestinians? Because after all, this is supposed to be part of of an eventual Palestinian state, Palestinian territory. Or should they belong to Jordan? Because they they were actually found when the land was under Jordanian control. And the uh, acquisition of a lot of those scrolls and, and a lot of the funding of DeVos' expedition was, was conducted not only under the auspices of the Jordanian government, but with funding that was provided by the Jordanian government. So you have three different entities here that all argue for um, a claim to the scrolls. Um, yeah, but uh, I mean, Israel holds the majority of them, right? So I think Israel is yes. clear. Uh, Israel holds the majority of them. And and what I like to say is that any eventual settlement between Israel and the Palestinians will need to take into account the site of Qumran and the Dead Sea Scrolls. Understood. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think that's all I have for you, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. It was uh, wonderful yeah. having you. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.